Well, welcome to Christ Church. We are grateful that we get to worship this glorious God with you today. Of course, both here in person and online. My name's Reverend Mike. I'm the Senior Associate Pastor here. Now, if you're new with us here at Christ Church, perhaps someone has invited you recently, and maybe you've been here, this is your first day, you've been just coming recently, recently, we want to bless you. If you've never filled out one of our online connect cards before and you fill that out today, we're going to give you a free item to our cafe. If you're joining us online, we're going to get you a gift card to a coffee shop near you. So where do you find that online connect card? MyChristChurch.com. It's at the top of the page. If you're here in person, there is a QR code in front of you. Scan that. It will take you that. Fill that out. We'll get you that gift. We do that to serve you. We do that because we're really grateful that we get to worship with you this day. So here's what's happening at Christ Church. If you're here with us in person, you may have noticed some tables out in Scripture Hall. Well, do you need to be a part of a connect group? Have you been looking for a connect group? Well, today is the day for you. What's a connect group? A connect group is a small group of Jesus followers who get together and study the word fellowship learn to be together in community to follow Jesus. So out in Scripture Hall today, we have several tables of our connect groups that are here around the church. Now, let me tell you, there are different types of connect groups out there. Uh, it's different stages of life that you may be in. You can find that out there. And they meet at different times during the week, including on Sunday mornings too. I know we have a faith and cancer support group out there. We got a prayer shawl ministry. We have men's ministry, women's ministry. There is a ministry for, excuse me, there's a connect group for people with athletes who are still uh, in high school or child's age, but there's all types of different connect groups out there. We encourage you, go and look at those after church today. All right, finally, over the last couple weeks and at Easter, we took, took a renovation offering. That offering was for the soundboard in this room. The soundboard in this room is the heart of the audio system. It is past its shelf life. We need a new soundboard. And we're going to connect people with Jesus. So I'm here to report the total offering to you. The total offering we collected was $86,901. Let's give God praise. Isn't that awesome? That's awesome. We thank God and we thank you for continuing to connect people with Jesus. Now will you pray with me as we begin worship this day? God, we have so much to celebrate. So we come to celebrate it in Christ. We come to do it together. We believe that you've led us to this moment. So God, we're going to sing a hallelujah to you this day. We thank you for the victory that comes through Jesus. And we pray this prayer through Jesus' strong name. And the church said, amen. Christ church, stand. Let's worship. Let me out of the desert Brought me into his streams A river of living water That turned my bitter into sweet And all my burdens are lifted You took the shackles off my feet There's no sound louder than A captive set free So let the redeemed
Your faithfulness is walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness All over my life All over my life I see your promises in fulfillment All over my life All of God be all over your life today. You may be seated. Now, in just a moment, we're going to collect God's tithes and our offerings. We encourage you to give online, mychristchurch.com slash give. Also, if you're here in person, we do have a giving, electronic giving kiosk. It's out in Scripture Hall across from the stairs. Text give. All those giving options electronically, if you're here in person, you can find through going to the QR code that is in front of you. And of course, you can give here in person. In a moment, our ushers are going to serve us by bringing by the offering bags. Will you pray with me? Loving God, we thank you that your goodness is all over our lives. We thank you for that goodness, God. We thank you, God. And now because of your goodness to us, we give back to you, great God, through your tithes and our offerings. Will you please bless all this gathered? nor the people may be connected with your son, Jesus Christ. We pray this through his name. Amen. As the ushers begin to serve us, we have a video for you today about Renovation 2024 and how we at Christ Church thinks, 
that God is going to touch the next generation through us. Take a look. Hey, I'm Reverend Shane. I'm here with Reverend Mike. We're excited to get moving on our sanctuary renovation. Obviously, it's been in the works yep. for some yep. time. We've talked about doing these renovations because we need to. The sanctuary is 16 years old. Several major systems need to be replaced. Now we're working on the sound system, but the HVAC system is another major system that the renovation is gonna address. Yeah, and we're not only doing this renovation from an infrastructure point of view, we're doing this for the future. We want the next generation to be connected with Jesus. Now, over the years, thriving churches across the country, they have changed the way that they connect people with Jesus, and they do it for future generations. Shane, how were you connected with Jesus when you were growing up? You know, Mike, I grew up as the church was shifting from a formal to a more informal expression of faith. So guitars and percussion sort of joined the piano and courses were sprinkled in along with hymns into the mix. I was part of the Jesus revolution. Holy Spirit moved in powerful ways. How about when you were growing up, Mike? Well, with my generation, higher production church services came to the forefront. Big screens and bright lights and rock and roll bands became fixtures in the church world. These technological advances incorporated into worship kept the church on the cutting edge, connecting my generation with Jesus. And just like each of you, the reason Shane and I experienced powerful worship service was because of a group of Christians who had gone before us, had the vision, the courage, and the faith to launch out beyond what they were comfortable with. They cared about the future more than they cared about their own preferences. Yeah, the greatest generation and the builders constructed the church for my generation. And then the builders and us boomers, we worked it out to build the church for your generation, Mike. Thanks, you. You're welcome. Now it's time for the boomers and millennials to come together to build the church for the next generation. You know, a great church doesn't happen by chance. It takes vision and sacrifice and it takes courage. We're gonna lose the next generation of faith if we do not step out. Like the Lord ping the hearts of previous generations, we believe God is telling us it is our time to step up and prepare the church for the future. It really is. And in the next two months, you will hear more about Renovation 2024. And in November, we're gonna ask you to make a two-year commitment to this campaign. We would like you to start praying right now for what that commitment will look like. When the boomers and millennials come together, we know God's gonna do something amazing for our kids and grandkids. And we're excited about what God is about to do for future generations of Christ Church. Mike, this is our time to be amazing. Daily, daily I surrender Your grace for today is all that I need Surprised by your mercy this new every morning Awaken my soul to see Awaken my soul to sing. I will trust where you lead. I will trust when I can see. Morning by morning, great is your faithfulness to me. Breath by breath, overtaking my way.
is His faithfulness, church. Today's scripture reading comes from Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 4, 1 through 12, excuse me. One day as he saw the crowds gathering, Jesus went up on the mountainside and sat down. His disciples gathered around him and he began to teach them. God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God blesses those who are humble, for they will inherit the whole earth. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will be shown mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called the children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you when people mock you and persecute you and lie about you and say all sorts of evil things against you because you are my followers. Be happy about it, be very glad for a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember the ancient prophets were persecuted in the same way. This is the word of God for you, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's greet one another and you may be seated. God is good all the time. time. I love this bumper for the new series because this was all taken where Jesus grew up. You know, a lot of times I like to joke about this at Christmas, but deep in our American hearts, we think Jesus was born in a barn in Indiana. And the reality is the topography that surrounded him had a great deal of influence in his ministry. And so I love that bumper. I I love to kind of get the feel for Jesus's time and Jesus's place. I want to say thank you to everybody that's been a part of our 500 campaign. Our, Our 500 initiative is 500 people inviting one new person to church for 60 weeks. And I want to thank all of you who have done that. We have seen incredible things that God is doing here. I've already got an incredible story. We've got somebody here who is part of our online community from Wisconsin, who came in to be here live today. So how cool is that? And what an absolute joy. And she'll be doing our new Ping Life study with us online. And what an absolute joy. You know, one of the things that people are telling me as they're inviting people to church is that they often invite people who are desperate, people who have challenges going on, people who are overwhelmed. I want to talk about that because Jesus talked about that. There's been a lot of interest in the last few decades about the historical life of Jesus of Nazareth, or as he would have been called in the Aramaic of his time, Yeshua Nazarea. He only lived 30 years and some change. He didn't write anything. We have no idea what he looked like despite all the pictures. Four testaments to his life and teachings called the Gospels provide almost everything we know about him. None of the Gospel readers or writers decided to write a complete biography. So we have pieces and parts. We have details, snapshots. It's it's more of a photo album than a movie. But what we did get was a substantial amount of his teaching. I truly wish we had more. But I have to believe that we got everything God wanted us to have. In this series, we're going to probe the Gospel of Matthew because of his attention to the Sermon on the Mount. If you've got one of those old Bibles that has the things Jesus said in red, there's a lot of red in Matthew. This is not a complete 
anthology of Jesus' teaching, but I'm pretty convinced it contains the greatest hits. These are radical stories that convey radical implications, and they describe a kingdom that we cannot see. My purpose in embracing this series is very clear. I think we've lost a lot of the punch of the countercultural teachings of Jesus for several reasons. Number one, I think we hear them through calloused ears. Have you ever heard something so often you don't hear it anymore? I also think we see these teachings through the lens of our own time. In a sense, we think of Jesus on a boat wearing a Nautica jacket and Nikes. It wasn't that. And the other thing is we encounter them through the emotions of modernity. We encounter Jesus' teaching through our own lens. And I think at times our lenses distort the teachings themselves. We have hushed, handled, hijacked, and frankly attempted to housebreak Jesus. We want Jesus to be the lovely spokesmodel for all of our causes and our brand of politics. But it's always going to be something Jesus refuses to do. You see, Jesus doesn't work for us. Jesus doesn't work for us. In this series, a very different Jesus is going to emerge than the one our culture purports. Because we begin with what we want Jesus to be. And then we try to make him into it. What we're going to do in this series is begin with the things Jesus actually said. And we're going to try to conform our lives into his. You see, Jesus doesn't get us nearly as much as we need to get him. I will not water Jesus down. I will not put words in his mouth. I'm not going to send Jesus to modern sensitivity training. I'm not going to politicize Jesus. And I'm not going to Americanize Jesus. In fact, I'm going to go out of my way to do none of those things. We're going to take his words at face value. And we're going to experience them. And their blunt force against our personal value systems. And against our cultural sensibilities. Jesus did not teach to affirm what everybody was already thinking anyway. Jesus taught to blow people's minds. And when we are done with this series, and it'll be close to Christmas by the time we are, when we're done with it, you're going to see why that after hearing Jesus teach, people either bowed down before him and worshipped him as God, or yelled crucify him, because he did not leave middle ground. We live in a culture that wants to seek middle ground on Jesus, and it just isn't there. It's not there. Late last summer, Melissa received a phone call that changed our lives. It could be summed up in a single word, malignant. Many of you have received a phone call like that. In the months that followed, all the way through Easter of this year, we were in this endless gauntlet of doctor's visits, tests, chemo, surgeries, and radiation. Praise God, as of the three-month checkup, the news is good, but that journey has forever changed our lives. Many of you have been through difficult times. And you know that you're changed. Melissa and I are different now. There are a lot of words I could use to describe this jagged trail through cancer treatment. But Jesus would only offer one word. We were blessed. We were blessed. Matthew 4 recounts the launch of Jesus' public ministry. He's baptized in the lower Jordan. He is tempted in the desolate Dead Sea region. He returns to Galilee. He hangs a ministry shingle. He re relocates from interior Nazareth to lakeside Capernaum. He chooses 12 disciples. He begins a regional traveling ministry. 
that features miracles, exorcisms, healing, and teaching. For three years, Jesus is the best show in Galilee. He sells out everywhere. He's also the most controversial. Always keep this in mind. They did not hang Jesus on a cross because he gets us. They hung Jesus on a cross because Jesus offended everything in every human who heard his words that does not align with the kingdom of God. Jesus gave people their lives back and disenfranchised and desperate people flocked to him. Jesus was fearless. He was not on anybody's payroll. And he not only took authority on, he'd go out of his way to do it. Huge crowds migrated to Galilee from every direction to find him. And Matthew reports he healed them all. He healed them all. Now, crowds are starting to form. And Jesus takes his leadership team, his, his disciples, up to a place to pour into them before he pours into the masses. Jesus is teaching them how to minister to desperate people. And in doing so, he's teaching us how to minister to desperate people. You need to understand, Jesus is not teaching best ministry practices. He's teaching us about the kingdom of God. The Sea of Galilee is one of my very favorite places in the world, and this material took place right there. We are going to be headed about a year from now on a pilgrimage to Turkey and Greece to follow Paul. But in January of 2026, we're going back to Israel and the whole trip will be spent in Israel. The Sea of Galilee has been known by many names throughout history, but by Jesus' time, I think most people would have called it Lake Tiberius in honor of the Roman emperor. The Mount of the Beatitudes, which we visit every trip, is the place that they've kind of denoted that Jesus gave the Sermon on the Mount. But to be honest, it doesn't matter where he said it. What matters is what he said. And if that's not the right place, it's certainly close. Jesus is reshaping the way we think, the way that we perceive reality. It's a tall order. Let's get at it. Verse 1. One day as the crowds gathered before him, Jesus went up the hillside to teach them. You see, if God is going to use us, he must purge us of all arrogance and human dignity and propriety. If God is going to use us to minister to desperate people, everything in us that's not of God has to be offended right out of us. Jesus wants to empty from us every ounce of pride, every impure motive, every rebellious instinct, every false God, every misplaced value, and every self-righteous inclination. Jesus, my friends, is an equal opportunity offender. Verse 2, and this is what he taught them. Jesus begins each thought in the, in the Beatitudes with, blessed are you. The Greek word that's translated blessed, it's really hard to get at. And a lot of translations translate it happy. But happy has at its root, hop, H-A-P. And, and hop means favorable circumstances. It means chance. And what is really being talked about here is anything but that. Uh, blessed has nothing to do with chance. It's a condition of the soul. It's a way of seeing life. It, it conveys a, a joy that has its own perpetual source. When Jesus said we're blessed, this isn't some kind of just hold on in the tough times and someday you'll feel blessed kind of thing. Jesus is saying, you're blessed right now. If Jesus were here today, he would say you're blessed right now. And some of you may be thinking, I don't feel blessed at all. Maybe some of you are crying out to God today. Maybe you're here on the worst day of your life. A few years back, a young man stopped me after this service. And he said, I want to say thank you. He said, I woke up this morning, I was going to blow my brains out. 
And something told me to go to church just one time before I did. And he said, your message gave me hope. There are a lot of desperate people. There's desperation in all of us. You might be crying out to God this morning in the midst of relational health, emotional, vocational, financial, or or even spiritual devastation. I need you to understand, so were the people who flocked to Jesus. People didn't come to Jesus because they had their acts together. People came to Jesus because they were desperate. And it's when we have nothing to offer but emptiness and frustration and hurt and doubt and pain that Yeshua Nazareth says, blessed are you. So I want you to say this with me. I am blessed. Say it. I am blessed. Jesus says, I am blessed. Say it with me. Jesus says, I am blessed. So I am blessed. Say it with me. So I am blessed. Let's put it all together. I am blessed because Jesus says, I am blessed. I am blessed. Blessed are you. Verse three, when we recognize how much we need God, we are blessed because the kingdom of God is our inheritance. The actual word here is, can be translated poor or poor in spirit. It, it combines a Greek notion that denotes adject poverty or what we might call being under-resourced with an Aramaic concept that means someone who has nothing but God. That's all they've got. They got nothing but God. Blessed begins with an awareness of our desperate need for God. So what I'm gonna say to you If you are not aware of your need for God, you are not blessed regardless of how well you think your life's going. And if you are aware of your need for God, you are blessed regardless of how poorly your life is going. When we are healthy, wealthy, upwardly mobile, when we have it all together, running with the in crowd and have the world by the tail and everyone wants to play our walk-up song, we might think we are invincible. Jesus would argue that's the most dangerous place all. He would rather suggest that we are most blessed when our health is tenuous, when the checkbook is low, when the promotion didn't come, our theories fall apart, our good deeds have not gone unpunished, when we have been rejected, when we feel that we are at our most vulnerable, because in such times we are acutely aware of our need for God. You see, those who want nothing but God will end up with everything, and those who have everything but God will end up with nothing. Verse four, when we have experienced overwhelming loss, we are blessed because we will find comfort. The Greek word used for overwhelming loss here means the most intense sort of mourning. It denotes the person that can't just get over it. You ever had something happen in your life and everybody tells you get over it? You should be over it by now. This denotes a person who can't get over it. Blessed are you when you have lost your loved ones, your health, your relationships, your marriage, your children, your finances, and everything you hold dear. Because you now have nothing but Christ. And when we have Christ, we have everything. Blessed are you when living seems too hard. Blessed are you when the pain seems too great. Blessed are you when the hurt is too great to overcome. Because no one will know better than you that Jesus will never leave you. And he'll never forsake you. Blessed are you. Verse 4. When we have experienced, I'm sorry, verse 5. When we are gentle, we are blessed. For we will inherit the earth There's no English word that does justice to the Greek word used here. So you have to go with meek, lowly, or gentle. And I like gentle by far the best. Gentle denotes that a thing has the capacity to do great harm, but chooses peace instead. So how does Jesus say to respond to the bad things that are going to happen to us? We are instructed to respond with gentleness. We could tear things up, but we are instructed to choose peace instead. To be gentle, something must have the capacity to do harm, but choose not to. A mouse can't be gentle. 
A mouse can be meek, but it can't be gentle. A bear can be gentle. We must choose the path of gentleness. We must choose to be thoughtful when it would be so much easier to be thoughtless. We must choose to be level-headed when it would be so much easier to spin out of control. We must choose to play for the long game when it would seem so much more gratifying to play for the right now. We must choose not to overreact when overreacting is exactly what we want to do. We must choose to be silent when we want to scream. And yes, we must choose to let the drama stop with us. We must choose to let the drama stop with us. You know something I've decided a long time ago? There's always the drama train coming down the tracks, and I've decided I'm going to be the end of the line. Because if you're not, where's that going to stop? Where's it going to stop? At some point, the drama's got to stop somewhere. And Jesus says it's going to stop with the gentle. It's going to stop with the gentle. Verse 7, when we are merciful, we are blessed, for we will be shown mercy. I'm sorry, let me get back to six. When we hunger and thirst for righteousness, we are blessed, for we will receive it in full. Maybe there's a mental slip here because this one's tough. Sometimes life kicks us. And sometimes life kicks us with its boots on. We've all been there. The fact life beats us up sometimes is what we most share in common. It's not what we have and our success that we share. It's the fact that life is hard sometimes that we share. And an attitude of brokenness before God. That's when we realize our our best lives are lived in submission to God, regardless of what we want to do. Having tasted the bitter things of this world, we begin to long for the coming of the kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. The Greek word for righteousness can equally be translated goodness or justice. And it says those who thirst for these things and are hungry for these things will be full. You always, always remember that a lot of Israel is a desert culture. Maybe if you grew up in poverty or experienced that at some point in your life, you know what it's like to not have enough to eat. You know what it's like to be hungry. Not to be hungry between meals and I need a Pop-Tart hungry, but to be truly hungry. Maybe you've had a time in your life that you've truly, truly been thirsty. Not, boy, could I use a Diet Coke. I've not ever experienced hunger. I'm grateful to God for that. But I have been thirsty. Because I played football in the late 70s. And back in those days, they thought dehydration built character in young men. (laughs) And in case you weren't getting dehydrated quickly enough, they gave you salt pills. (laughs) That we just popped like racehorses. I remember being two hours into a practice on an 85 degree August morning where you could cut the air with the knife, and our practice field was dirt. And I remember waiting to get a drink. And they had this great big thing that looked like a horse trough where you got your drinks. And I was a wide receiver, which meant we had to let the linemen go first. (laughs) Because if we caught a ball, we got in the papers, and they didn't, so they got to drink first. And I remember being so thirsty... Anybody play football in the late 70s? I remember that dirt field, and you could crunch your teeth, and you could hear the dirt crunching in your teeth. I remember thinking I was going to swallow my tongue, but I didn't because I couldn't swallow. And I just remember sitting there waiting for a drink. I couldn't wait. And a lineman was in front of me, a tackle. I still remember his name, and I'm not going to mention it in case he's here. So I remember... He is there, he rips off his helmet, and it looks like somebody's just poured dirt all over his head. He is a filthy mess. He's about this tall and about this wide. And it's his turn to drink. And he takes his helmet off 
and he sticks his entire stinking head in the water. And then I thought, should I just die here? <laughs> I know a little bit of what it's like to be thirsty. Jesus says, when we truly hunger and thirst for God and the kingdom of God, we should be happy. We're blessed because those hungers and thirsts will one day be satisfied. Verse 7, when we are merciful, we are blessed because we will be shown mercy. Now Jesus is about to turn it up a little bit. You ever done something in the last time, turn it up a little bit? Here we go. Word translated mercy means total empathy, kindness without judgment. Thursday night, I'm flying home from Dallas. Couldn't catch a plane until about 9.30, so took a red eye into St. Louis from Dallas. I'm seated on the very back of the plane, the very back seat. The plane's filling up. I thought, how many people can be going to St. Louis from Dallas at 9.30 at night? An entire plane full, apparently. <laughs> I'm sitting on the back seat, I'm by myself, and I'm hoping nobody sits in the other two seats. You guys ever been there? I'm just hoping they don't. As I was walking in to get boarded and through the ticket thing, there was a woman and a little bitty girl, and she had a sign that says, I, did not, I do not speak English. Could you help me board the plane? The first thing that occurred to me is my Spanish is not good enough to be helpful. I'm really good at chit chat and I'm really good in restaurants, but I don't know enough Spanish to be helpful. And then fortunately I looked up and the people at the desk had seen her and I knew she was gonna get help. So I just went on, but I, I, I thought for a moment, what, what, what's going on here? She didn't have luggage. She just had a, looked like a trash bag. And everything she had was on it. And that little girl was just holding her hand. Well, they got on the plane last. And there were no other seats on the plane, so I knew good and well where they were headed. <laughs> so they came to my row, and I got out of the way, and they went against the window in the middle seat. And I smiled and waved. She seemed relieved. So as we got up in the air, the uh, flight attendant came out to bring drinks, as they do. And the, we were first, because we were at the very back. And, and she looks at this woman, and she says, would you and your daughter like a drink? And she just held up her hands, because I knew she didn't speak English. And she went, no, 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 no. And it was clear that, that she thought they were selling drinks, not giving them away. And she just said, no, no, no. And the attendant could have gone on easily, because she said no. But the attendant wouldn't do that. She gave her Spanish a shot. She said, Habla Espanol? See? By the time it all got done, this woman and her little girl got a really good thing of orange juice and far more kind bars and cookies than the rest of us got. <laughs> and she took her catch and she put it in her trash bag. And then her and her little girl were getting ready to go to sleep and they pulled a blanket out of that trash bag. And on the blanket it said American Red Cross. As I slept, I thought to myself, we don't have to speak the same language, understand the plight of another person, know someone personally or agree with their politics to show mercy and kindness. When the flight was over, I turned around because that flight attendant was right behind me. I said, I want to say thank you. She said, for what? I said, for being so kind to that woman and her daughter. I said, that was at least 13 kinds of awesome. Thank you. And she just beamed. We're blessed when we offer mercy to others because we have placed ourselves in position to receive God's mercy and without God's mercy, none of us stand a chance. Not one of us. Number eight, the pure in heart will see God. The deliberate process of showing mercy purifies the soul. The Greek word refers to an army that has been purged of all disloyal, weak, cowardly, insubordinate, and undisciplined men. When you get all the bad soldiers out, what you got are good soldiers. You got a pure army. 
And in the same sense, the tough times in life allow God to filter out the ungodly things from our lives. And what we have left is a pure reliance upon Christ. Purity probes far beyond the surface level of good deeds and it questions our motives. Pure hearts are the product of brokenness and loss and hunger and thirst. Those who are purified by the troubles and trials of life will see God. Verse 9, those who work for peace will be called the children of God. The Hebrew concept of shalom, which is used here, does not point to the absence of troubles. It points to the presence of God. For Jesus, peacemaking is not a passive exercise. It's active. Peacemakers are God's ambassadors who don't fix every problem. They introduce Christ into every situation. They are often those who have been at war much of their lives themselves. Most true peacemakers I know have spent a sizable amount of their life at war. No one appreciates peace like a soldier who's been on the battle lines. And those who make peace will be called God's children. And verse 10, those who suffer for Christ will inherit the kingdom of heaven. My preaching professor in seminary, Fred Craddock, told us very clearly, he said, if you all go out there and preach the gospel, your churches will love you. And if you go out there and live the gospel, they will run you out of town. So how does the world treat those who strive to apply the words of Jesus? Poorly. Verses 11 and 12, blessed are you when you are mocked and persecuted and slandered. For a great reward awaits you in heaven. And remember the prophets were persecuted too. You see, the message of Jesus stung the ears of the wicked. And they stung the ears of the self-righteous. But they were life itself to the desperate. They were life itself to the desperate. Jesus will offend the wickedness right out of you. And Jesus will offend the religion out of you too. But for those who are desperate, he is life and life abundant. You see, if we are going to embrace Jesus, we have to not only confess and turn away from our carnal lusts, but we also have to confess and turn away from our spiritual pride. I said this as we entered the 500 campaign. You will never bring anyone closer to Jesus if deep in your heart you think you're better than they are. And Jesus reminds us it is our pain that we share, not our success. And to all people who experience pain and brokenness, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So we are blessed when? We are blessed when we recognize our need for God. We are blessed when we have nothing but Christ. We are blessed when we choose the path of gentleness. We are blessed when we long for righteousness, goodness, and justice. We are blessed when we are merciful. We are blessed when we are purified by trial. We are blessed when we work for peace. We are blessed when we suffer for Christ. And you say, Pastor, how is it that that stuff's a blessing? Because Jesus said if we do those things, we will receive heaven. We will be comforted. We will inherit the earth. We will be made righteous. We will be shown mercy. We will see God. We'll be called the children of God. And we will receive the kingdom. And the very last thing that Jesus said in the Beatitudes fascinates the daylights out of me. Remember the prophets were persecuted too. You mind if I translate that? Buck up little buckaroos. <laughs> Buck up little buckaroos. Instead of sitting around all day thinking how bad things are, Jesus said, sit around all day and think about how blessed you are. Because the worst things are going for you right now. 
the closer you will be drawn to God and the closer God will draw to you. If times are tough right now, Jesus would say, you are blessed. If you know right now that without God, you do not have a chance, Jesus would say, you are blessed. And I don't know about you, but there's something I've noticed in my life. Something I've noticed about Jesus. When there's about 0% chance of success, he's often just getting started. And the place to start is by changing the way we think. And that is what Jesus taught us. Would you pray with me? Great and mighty God, we all hurt. There might be people today going through the roughest stretch of their whole life. Would you help them see that they're blessed? There may be people here today who think they're all that in a bag of communion wafers. Would you let them see how dangerous is their position? Thank you for these incredible words of Jesus. Thank you that when we hurt, when we're overwhelmed, when we don't know what to do, when we can't just get over it, that Jesus said, blessed are we. And thank you for the gift of your church. The gift of not a place to attend, but a family to which we can belong. And as people leave here today and see all the opportunities to get involved in small groups and and classes and ministries, help them to see this isn't about something else for you to do. This is about plugging into the family making friends, experiencing grace. Thank you, dear God, that we are blessed in Jesus' name. Amen. On each side of me and up in the balcony, there will be some people up here who would love to pray for you. If you're going through a difficult time right now, you may think nobody cares. You're wrong. You're wrong. Jesus cares. And you might think this is the worst place you've ever been. You're wrong again. Because if you recognize your need for Christ, your life at this moment is just beginning. Would you stand as we worship God together? gave your life for mine nailed to the cross you crucified all my sin and shame it was washed by your mercy you are the treasure I find my reason for living so my heart the veil in between was torn apart now you hold the keys to the grave cause you bring things to life you roll stones away all praise to the Lord most high all praise to the one who saved my life all praise Christ, my King of heaven, my King forever. All praise to the Lord most high. All praise
Sunday.